As the month of March begins, an era ends at the Central Bank of Kenya with the retirement of Professor Ndugun Ndungu as the governor of the Central Bank. But what kind of legacy is he leaving as he leaves the helm of East Africa's largest single central bank? We'll be examining that particular issue in a lot more detail and plenty more from across Africa in the next half hour. Thank you for joining us. I'm Raman Yang in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Here's what's coming up. South Africans are enduring hard times of load shedding, even as Midupi finally starts to put power into the grid. From the tracks to fashion, the renowned Kenyan athlete Lona Kiplagat unveiled her sportswear line. We we'll begin tonight with a focus on the change of guard, if you will, at Kenya's central bank. After eight years as governor, Professor Njugun Ndungu's term in office has come to an end. And the search for his successor is still in progress. He leaves office, however, with a mixed track record. In 2006, the year before he took office, just a quarter of Kenyan adults had access to some sort of financial service. Banks, insurance, microfinance, you name it. As he leaves, however, financial inclusion levels have exploded. On his watch, almost seven out of every ten Kenyans now, ten Kenyan adults that is, now have some kind of financial service access. To a large extent, that expansion of access came about through mobile money, of which m of course, is the most famous example. By June 2014, there were 25 million mobile money accounts in Kenya. Agent banking was also a key driver of this expansion by boosting the number of access points for formal financial services. After eight years in office, however, spreads between lending and deposit rates among Kenya's over 40 commercial banks does remain relatively high, about 10%. In 2014, central bank data showed that spreads fluctuated in a very narrow tight range between 9.8% and 10.6%. Keep in mind, average lending rates were over 16%. To his credit, however, Professor Ndungo didn't bow to short-term pressure to impose price controls of any sort while he was in office. Let's examine the good professor's record in a bit more detail. Johnson Derry's an economist is also in charge of corporate advisory services at ABC Capital, who's with us in studio right now. Um, Mr. Derry, let's start with your initial impression, your broad overview, if you will, of the last eight years of Professor Ndungo's time in office. Well, I think the, I've been trying to look for a word to describe uh, his, 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 um, his, his tenure as a CBK governor. And I think I'd, the, the word I'd use is eventful. Uh, uh, like you, use the, you also use the adjective mixed, mixed uh, performance. I, I think I'd go that as, with that as well. But eventful, I think, would be more, more apt in my opinion. Kenya's explosion in financial inclusion, including the use of mobile money, that happened uh, on his watch. What sort of developments in that sector do you think his successor will have to deal with moving forward over the next eight or four years? Actually, actually um, I'd, I'd rather look at it differently. Uh, how about we think about it this way? We, the, can, can, can the next governor emulate him uh, with regards to acceptance of innovation? Because without innovation, a lot of um, you know Kenyans will not have been able to access uh, uh, financial services uh, that that Juguna uh, Dungo made possible in his, in his in his tenure as the CBK governor. Indeed, let's focus on the one thing that he's of course been criticised, shall we say, for the spread between lending and deposit rates during his time in office has remained relatively static, around ten or so percentage points, and that's been a very sore point over the last eight years. What could or should he have done better to narrow that gap? I'm not. I'm not sure any, he'd have done. It, he, he was in a position to do anything better because, largely, and I've, and I kept saying this a lot of times uh, over many different shows, that the 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 spread is a function of. I mean, the key driver of that spread is uh, lack of savings. Now that 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 is a supply side issue, and and more likely, um, the, the the factors that co that control that are you know f fiscal fiscal policy uh, and you're talking about taxation and you're talking about uh, um yeah largely taxation and uh, that 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 has kind of uh, uh, squeezed the kenyan uh, the kenyan and 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 because of uh, that that he's been unable to save and that has shown up in in large trade uh, spreads uh, credit spreads but let's let's be frank here and there i mean if banks are offering interest rates of what five percent 
6%, which for the last eight years have essentially been below inflation. There's virtually no incentive here for you know, to actually save their money with banks, is there? No, you see, uh, there, there, there are certain factors you need to take into account. For example, uh, the, the numbers that generate the, the, that kind of performance uh, are usually take say, um, bank deposits in aggregate. Uh, if you if you segregate the savings accounts, if it's the fixed deposit accounts, you'll probably end up with much much higher figures, and 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 banks are not cheap to run. Uh, they they face some costs here and there. Um, the the obviously the the big the bigger banks with the with the credit uh, with the current accounts uh, stand out and 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 people obviously use those as reference points. But remember there are four, there are forty three banks out there and. Um, a lot of them uh, don't don't enjoy spreads that huge. One so last question. Keep that in mind. Indeed, one last question for you, Ndari. Um, given the extent to which occasionally the interbank market has seized up, we saw that happening after the Safari Com IPO. We've seen it happening again a few other times, and there's a problem with the flow of liquidity from government onto the suppliers and so on. Do you think his successor needs to push banks to consolidate? Forty-three banks for a market of what, forty-plus million people seems a bit crowded, for lack of a better word. Uh, I wouldn't push for that. The market, I, 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 would, I, I would venture to argue the market knows best. And here's, a, here's the issue. Um, if, you, if you push for consolidation, um, we've, we've seen how that has worked out in Nigeria. Uh, it has not uh, ended a uh, financial crisis. Uh, in fact, what it does is it creates uh, too big to fail. Now, uh, I'm not sure how much we want to have that in our economy. Uh, one one in institution that, you know, if, if it fails existen if it faces existen existential threats then you're talking about uh, uh, implosion of an economy I'd rather we have uh, um, lack of concentration if you could if you could put that because then you don't have concentration risk and that way um, you, you you have better stability uh, and the market gets to decide what is the appropriate number of, of institutions out there. But in 30 seconds, Neri, 50% of the assets in the banking sector are concentrated in any case in five banks. Aren't we already at the point where we can say we have a concentration risk factor already in the Kenyan banking system? Yes, but there's always the chance of an equity bank coming out of nowhere, uh, just like equi equity bank did. Um, and and, and that, that, that helps with the, with the, with the matters altogether. Uh, we've seen um, uh, the way Malimu Sako has pushed on some of its, uh, I mean, the business uh, tie-up with with, uh, equatorial inv uh, with Equatorial Commercial Bank, and that should create an interesting dynamic. Now, if Equatorial Commercial Bank was not available for that, you can imagine what we'll be talking about. So it is this kind of um, uh, dynamics that we will probably lose out, uh, innovations and, and, and different uh, arrangements uh, and configurations in the banking sector where uh, that the 43 the, no, the number 43 probably allows that maybe 10 will not allow us indeed we'll have to leave there for the time being as always thank you for your time and your input johnson Derry there in charge of corporate advisory services at abc capital let's talk about small businesses in south africa they're having to find ways of navigating around the country's electricity crisis the power utility in that country escom which supplies over 90 percent of that country's power is unable to ensure a stable reliable power supply it has resorted to regular rolling blackouts in order to save the national grid from total collapse smes now have to invest in alternative sources of energy in order to keep the operations running Simri Tanaidu spoke to a local shop owner in Johannesburg to find out how he's surviving amid the energy crisis. This convenience store in Melville, a busy Johannesburg suburb, opens from 8 in the morning until 10 o'clock every night. The owner was forced to install a generator because of regular power cuts. When we didn't have generator, it was a lot of chaos. Uh, people used to come in and we didn't uh, used to have uh, airtime and stuff like that. So they just used to walk out. Two, three times I did this, then I used to just close my business. The petrol generator is used regularly as a result of load shedding, the controlled power cuts by ESCOM. It doesn't come cheap, but it's better than not being able to carry on business. To get a generator, it costed me like you know, $150 to $200. Uh, it's been a good investment. Uh, the, the business is, seems to be like keep on running. Like It's not that normal it should be, how the lights help me, the electricity, but it's fine, it's not that bad. But the generator does not power the whole shop. Khuri is unable to sell cold drinks and cell phone chargers when the lights go out, a big revenue loss. 
not all the power comes out. I've got some uh, lines here that only certain, let's say, six or seven bulbs that goes on, and my machine, a till machine and ATA machine. That's it. No, nothing else. Meanwhile, other businesses in the area that haven't been able to fit in any alternative sources of energy are forced to close shop during the power cuts. Uh, load shedding costs about a thousand dollars a month. Uh, that is about ten percent of the turnover. We are greatly looking at that installing generators now, but we have to look at the, the generator, which will cost us even more because it has to pull out the, the extractor fans. Power cuts have become a way of life in South Africa, and for many small business owners, they will have to adapt or cut jobs or even possibly close down. But more and more South Africans are starting to look at new energy sources. Even when ESCOM is able to ensure a stable power supply, it may be very expensive. Electricity tariffs have gone up over 100% in the last five years. Sumitra Nadu, CCTV, Johannesburg. For more, let's head over to Johannesburg, where Kulu Pesiwe is live. He's ESCOM's acting spokesman. Um, thank you for your time this evening, sir. Madupi's first synchronization was due to happen way back in January. What caused this delay all the way through to March? Well, good evening to you and to our viewers as well. Well, generally what has happened over a number of years is uh, um, um, we, we initially we had a lot of uh, industrial action at the power station and when they ended then we, we had issues to deal with uh, the one of our contractors who was responsible for the welding work on, on our boilers. And then uh, basically we, we had to um, remove them, put on another contractor so that they can undo some of the welding works that was done on, 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 the, uh, on, on the boiler by the initial contractor. So those things cumulatively added into what we are seeing now in terms of delays. But we have since made some strides and as you correctly say, Yesterday, we, we synchronized the first unit of Midupi Power Station, and uh, in the next two months or so, we will be getting the first 800 megawatts from that unit. Indeed. Uh, as you point out, this unit will be coming along online over the next three months. Give us a sense of the timeline that South Africans ought to expect for the remainder of the units in Midupi to come online as well. Yes. In total, Midupi will have uh, six uh, generating units. And the first one will come online um, officially in terms of commercial operation in June this year. And then in intervals of about 18 months, we will gradually bring into service the remainder of the other units. It is important to take a pause and, and also reflect that we are actually building five new power stations at the current moment. So besides Midupi, there's another one called Kusile, which is also going to produce the same amount of electricity as Midupi, which is about 4,800 megawatts. Then we also have renewable energy projects, two of them. One is going to be a solar project producing 100 megawatts, another 100 megawatts from a wind facility, and then we also have a, 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 a pump storage facility, which is going to produce just uh, uh, under 2,000 mega, uh, 3,000 megawatts. So in total, we, um, between now and 2020, we will be gradually bringing all, all of those power stations into service and that will help us to stabilize the power system. Uh, give us a sense of to what extent does this solve ESCOM's current capacity problems, if at all, because Unit 6 by itself is about 800 or so megawatts and every time you guys have to take off, uh, declare Stage 1 or Stage 2 emergency, you're taking off 2 gigawatts, 1 gigawatt of capacity. It seems this will give you some breathing room. Well, indeed, um, 800 megawatts, when it uh, ultimately comes online, it is going to relieve us in terms of the pressure that we are feeling currently. But it is not going to solve all our problems. So essentially, it will assist us in terms of keeping blackouts or, or um, what people call blackouts, but generally we call, it, we call them load shedding. So we're going to keep those things uh, um, out of our way for, for temporarily, but it is only until we bring into operation the first unit of uh, Kusile power station, in addition to this one of uh, uh, Midupi power station, that we will be able to safely say that the power system is becoming uh, relatively um, sort of okay. So in other words, between uh, now and the next two years, we are likely to continue to have power interruptions from time to time. But uh, in good days like today, for example, and yesterday, 
and, and other days before today, we did not have to implement load shedding because all our generators were working optimally. And if this continues, we will not have to load shed. Right, we'll have to leave it there for the time being. Thank you for your input. That's Kulu Pesiwe, the uh, acting spokesperson for ESCOM, South Africa's dominant utility live in Johannesburg. South Africa, quick run through the markets now for you. Clean set of green numbers right across the board. Keep a close eye, however, on the NEC 20 share index in Nairobi. As we mentioned yesterday, smack in the middle of reporting season. But in trading today, Mumia Sugar getting absolutely battered. And it all has to do with the fact that Kamesa safeguards have ended. The Kenyan market for sugar essentially is wide open for you to bring your sugar right into East Africa. Coming up next is quite an uproar in Ghana over new import levies in order to ensure product standards. We'll have the details on that. And who should pay for healthcare in Africa? We'll be examining that question in detail next. Africa is on the move. It's only seven of the world's ten fastest growing economies. We help you make sense of the fast-changing African business landscape. We take you where your business is happening. Global Business, weekdays at this time on CCTV Africa. Welcome back. You're watching Global Business Africa from the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Let's take you over to Ghana. Major businesses in the West African state are calling for all companies to strike this Wednesday over proposed new import legislation. Now, the government says this new conformity assessment program would guarantee that all imported goods are up to standard. But some businesses say it's simply going to make life for them a lot tougher. Here's Katerina Vitotti telling you why. An extra cost for business or protection for consumers. Government and industry are clashing over new regulations which make sure imported goods are up to standard. But some businesses aren't happy with the plan known as the Conformity Assessment Programme or GCAP. Trade groups say there are already adequate checks in place. In an interview to local media, the head of the country's Importers and Exporters Association said we think GCAP is a duplication of functions. It'll add another layer of burden, another layer of cost for importers in this country. And at the end of the day, it is the consumer who will suffer. Key Ghanaian business consortiums are calling on all businesses to go on strike this Wednesday because of GCAP. They say the new legislation will make life even tougher for Ghanaian importers who are already struggling with a weak local currency. But the government says that GCAP will actually help local business because their checks are made on the goods before they leave their country of origin and it's the exporters who will pay the bill. And some companies that sell imported products say they would welcome tougher rules. This shop sells imported mobile phones. Its manager says substandard imports are a problem and are dangerous to consumers. There is a lot of health and safety risk with that. When we talk about um, power um, in terms of the batteries for electronics, and this could explode, and they are not too good for our landfills, if I should say, and this uh, I've got hazardous chemicals which would definitely have an, a health impact on the people in future. The government says it is listening to concerns and that it has already postponed the introduction of GCAP uh, to allow for more discussion with industry. Katerina Vitozzi, CCTV, Accra. Now, structuring and raising capital for investments in healthcare, that will be one of the things under discussion at the Executive Investment Conference organized by the Wharton Club of Africa in Lagos in about two weeks' time. All right, at the heart of this discussion is a very simple question. Who should pay for healthcare services? Now, the answer in Kenya's case is to scale up mandatory premiums from the 1st of April for the National Medical Insurance Fund. Even then, however, it really won't change insurance penetration rates in East Africa's biggest economy. At the moment, they're about 4%. As Dr. Felix Solale, chairman of the Excelsior Group, told me, the flip side of this financing and service provision challenge is that there's quite a bit of room for private sector investments in healthcare. Public sector indigent uh, primary care population is a role of government. Yeah. Middle class, who have ability to pay, we believe is a role of private sector largely. Now, there's no reason why 
in some cases we can't serve them through a good, well-functioning public system. And then the ones who are really at the top often tend to have employment, they have insurance, mm -hmm. so they're not suffering as much from a financing challenge compared to the other, segment, to mm -hmm. the other segments. Mm -hmm. So really this is about taking a business view or an enterprise view mm -hmm. within healthcare, much like you would do with infrastructure, much Absolutely. like you would do with power, mm -hmm. um, to really then build an ecosystem that can thrive and drive economic growth. And this is the sweet spot that you focus on, that, that middle class unmet need yes. for clinical services across sub-Saharan Africa. What markets excite you the most in sub-Saharan Africa and why? I, th I think there are three sectors uh, which again have these underlying dynamics mm -hmm. that I just described. Um, one is diagnostics. Yeah. Um, so if, if you have money and you have access to a hospital, mm -hmm. this is in Kenya, Nairobi, mm -hmm. you still have a chance of 36% that your, uh, diagnos that your diagnosis will be wrong. Mm -hmm. And so the issue becomes, well, how do we actually offer this fundamental service that then allows the doctor to be able to make a decision, allows the healthcare system to function properly, mm -hmm. reduces inefficiencies, mm -hmm. right? And by the way, is one of the most profitable sectors you'll ever, uh, you'll ever be able to invest in, 30, 35% margins. Mm -hmm. So diagnostics is one we're very excited about. I like medical education. Mm -hmm. I think medical education, uh, if you look at the, the number of doctors we need, the number of healthcare workers we need to serve this demand, again, woefully underserved, big opportunity, profitable business. And of course, uh, at the same time, there's also a, a dearth, a lack of that talent coming into the market. Precisely, precisely. Mm -hmm. And we did one thing, uh, Aramo, when I, when I came back home uh, to Kenya in 2011, I worked with uh, Strathmore Business School along with a professor called Professor Steve Samlet at Wharton to set up an MBA in healthcare management program mm -hmm. at Strathmore. Mm -hmm. And we're graduating 25 students uh, from that program uh, this year. Mm -hmm. So on the leaders manager side, we're starting to solve that problem. Because that now that also bridges the gap, essentially creating 25 more of you. Well, hopefully. <laughs> with That's the goal. People with, with, with a medical <laughs> training, but Absolutely. also an understanding of the business side. Absolutely. Um, there's Absolutely. A, there's, let's go back to a statistic that you put out there. 36% chance of getting your diagnostics wrong. Yes. If that's being done in Kenya. How did you arrive at that figure? What, what, well, so what the, contributes the, the, So the, the, these are actually statistics that, you, that we take out of the public sector hospitals where you look at a lab that is misread. Mm -hmm. You look at a, um, a, uh, a misdiagnosis in terms of the clinical history of the patient. Mm -hmm. You look at people who then um, may even have the right diagnosis but who are treated with the wrong medication mm -hmm. because A, either the machine was not working or B, the medication was not particularly the right one so there's a lot of flaws within the system mm -hmm. that then become an opportunity mm -hmm. to set up adequate diagnostics. Um, and if you recall, this is actually a high margin business. Yeah. So as a private sector investor, I'd love to be able to build uh, imaging centers, which we are doing. I'd mm -hmm. love to be able to build labs, which we're doing, and do it at the right level of quality because that is a profitable, high return business uh, mm -hmm. for an investor to invest in. And later on tomorrow, we'll be looking at investment flows, not just from outside the continent into Africa, but also in and around African countries as well. Quick run through commodity prices here for you. Um, crude oil, 16.95 is an irrelevant number for Brent crude, but there's an element of crude irony, if you will, around Nigeria and oil prices. The fact that the Naira has plunged so far against the American dollar is actually making life for oil importers, or fuel importers rather, in Nigeria much, much harder. That's contributing in part to the fuel crunch that the country's facing right now. Coming up next, how's this for diversification from the tracks? to fashion cutwalks. A renowned Kenyan athlete, Lorna Kiplagat, is unveiling a line of branded sportswear. Welcome back. Now, she was known for her power and aggression on the track. And now, Kenyan champion Lorna Kiplagat has taken those exact same qualities off the track to the runway with the launch of her African women's sportswear line. Here's Mahia Mutyo with her story on Grassroots Tonight. 
After 20 years of wearing other sports clothing brands, Lorna Kiplagat, known locally by her Kenyan fans as Simba because of her powerful, aggressive running style, has launched her own sportswear line. The venture is being touted as a quest to bring an African touch to women's sports attire. Lorna Sports Apparel is an African-inspired design. Uh, it's a design that makes you feel happy when you are training. When you are in Lona, it feels good. When you are running, it dries up very quickly. You don't feel that this sweaty going around. Um, we did design Lona using our colors of our culture. Um, we also did design Lona in a way that it will wear fashion meets sports. The Lorna brand is currently available in Nairobi's Galleria Mall and plans are underway to make it available in other towns across the country. It carries the tagline, Feel Africa Running. Kenyans remember Kiplagat mostly when she beat the heat and strong competition in 2007 to win the gold medal at the IAAF World Cross Country Championships in Mombasa. Even with sponsorships from big brands, she says that she was still dissatisfied with them and felt that something was amiss. I was sponsored by other brands and um, I always felt that I was missing something. And every time you get your running gear, you are like, oh, it's either very red or very, you know, there was nothing which was inspiring you to, to go out there and perform. The Lona brand has arrived at a time when Kenyans are moving towards a fitness culture. The brand's entry into the lucrative fitness market will see it compete with existing international brands such as Adidas, Nike and Puma, among others. In our designs, apart from the fabric, which is uh, the fabric which is very the high hand, it's also the stitching, it's also the details. If you see this, uh, this detail here, we took the Maasai beads and put it into uh, a design. Lona Kiplagat has won four world titles and one European title. She has participated in three Olympic Games and has won marathons in Los Angeles, Amsterdam, Rotterdam and Osaka. Mahia Mutua, CCTV. Quick run through the currencies here before we tell you what's in the pipeline for tomorrow's program. The Naira just around the 200 Naira to the dollar mark as usual. The South African ransom weakness uh, coming through over there as well, especially off the back of that threat for a downgrade. We'll keep tabs on that story and let you know how it develops in future. Now, here's what's in the pipeline for tomorrow's program. We'll be in Ethiopia. It's touted as one of the fastest growing economies in Africa. Growth has been largely driven in part by foreign investors. Prime Minister Haile Mariam Dessalen will be telling you how he intends to maintain those growth levels. And elsewhere in Harare, residents of Zimbabwean capital are on a collision course with city authorities over chicken. Apparently, they're not taking too kindly to backyard poultry projects, which for years have been a source of much-needed extra income, and now they've been banned. We'll tell you what exactly will happen next right here on Global Business. Well, that's it for tonight's edition of the program. Thank you so much for watching. We always like hearing what you think about what we do around here. Global Business Africa at cctv.com is the email to use. And of course, when we're not on air, Facebook and Twitter are your ports of call. We'll see you in the next 23 hours. I'm Ramanyai.